All right. Well, it's 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 time to start, and I'm excited about this workshop. Uh, uh, I have a lot of respect for uh, the Tolly Group. They are doing amazing work and have QSPs all over the place. I see their vehicles all over Central and Northern California. And uh, uh, with under Robin's leadership, she's got some wonderful staff that are working for her. So I want to give them as much time as possible. I have here Robin and Juan. And so why don't you introduce yourselves and introduce your company and um, then I'm excited to hear what you have for us today. All right, awesome. Thank you, John. First off, um, I'm really honored to be here. Uh, many, many years ago, I took my first QSD class, QSP QSD class, and that was with John. Um, and he's an, an excellent instructor, has a lot of knowledge, so I'm actually very honored to be here. Um, so we are with Tully Consulting Group. Um, we've been around uh, since 2005 and got really more into stormwater. And when the new permit came about, a uh, construction general permit came about in 2011. And we do uh, mostly SWIP and uh, water pollution control plans and uh, stormwater inspection and water quality monitoring. Hi, everyone. My name is Swan. I've been with Tilly Consulting for about five years. I took a class with John about maybe three months ago in July. John is definitely an exceptional instructor, so we're definitely glad to be partnering with them today. Today, we're going to be teaching you a little bit about winterization, so stay tuned. Changing the slides here. <laughs> nope, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this workshop is on winterizing construction sites. Um, with winter just around the corner, you're probably wondering, how can I prepare my construction site for winter? Um, we want all of you to be ready for the upcoming winter season, so we'll be reviewing the Caltrans winterization amendments um, and some tips and BMPs on preparing your construction site for winter. Workshop objectives. Today we're going to be talking about winterization, Caltrans winterization amendments, benefits of winterization, what if we fail to winterize, best management practices, and at the end we're going to have a Q&A, questions and answers. All right, what is winterization? It's implementing practices for soil stabilization, sorry, site stabilization, erosion prevention, sediment control, and pollution prevention. These practices help construction sites prepare for the rainy season. The rainy season is generally mid-October to mid-April in California. Um, actual dates will vary with location. Um, and with crazy climate change, um, these uh, are changing. So it's not, it's not as uh, predictable anymore that it's always mid-October to mid-April. Um, we just had a rain in September and sometimes we still get rains in May and June. Today, we're gonna to be emphasizing Caltrans winterization amendments. So Caltrans winterization amendments were due on September 15th. So if you have a Caltrans site, it should, have, it should have already been submitted. The winterization must include an updated schedule, I'm going to emphasize that the updated schedule should be a water pollution control schedule in addition to your CPM schedule. So the water pollution control schedule should have your BMPs as to when we're going to spray hydraulic mulch, when we're going to cover stockpiles, when we're going to go around and maintain drain and protection, among the other BMPs that we should be doing for winterization practices. Is there anything that you want to add to the schedule, Robin? Um, nope. We're going to talk a little bit later about the importance of proper scheduling. So definitely we'll, we'll hit that in a few moments. In addition to the schedule, the winterization plan must include materials and labor. So that should include the plastic, how many, however many plastic rolls you feel that we need to have a successful, uh, to have successful erosion control, if that's what we choose to use, plastic. The crew, the size of the crew that we're going to be using for the project. The bigger the project, the bigger the crew. If it's a small project, we might get away with two to three guys. If it's a large project, we might need a dozen crew members. So that definitely depends on the size of the project. We're going to take a look at the monitoring location. So that's really for stormwater sampling. Um, and this uh, pertains where we're going to sample if it were to rain today or tomorrow. Our sampling locations. Are we going to sample at the drain inlets, uh, at a drain inlet at XYZ location, or are we going to sample at this location where we get discharged into some sort of water body. So we need to update the monitoring locations. We're going to be talking about slope stabilization. Like I mentioned, we need to figure out what type of slope stabilization we're going to be using. We could use plastic, we could use hydraulic mulch, we could use erosion control blanket, and all of these BMPs, whatever you prefer to use or whatever you choose to use, 
should be called out in your winterization plan. All right, and um, we're gonna a winterization amendment should cover the management of run on and run off on your project site over winter. Um, how are you gonna keep that water clean? Um, what erosion control methods are you gonna use? Um, and then um, where is the water gonna go? And how are you gonna keep that controlled so it's not causing erosion um, when it's leaving your project site? Um, you also wanna talk about management of conveyance down slope. Um, how, are, how is the water gonna get over your slope safely? Um, you know, can we channel it otherwise? Um, and then the winterization amendment should also cover um, your management for your suspended work areas. What are you going to do to button those up? Um, and then any other, you know, stabilized or unstabilized um, disturbed soil areas. Where are you going to be working? What's active? And how are you going to uh, button that up if you need to, if you have a rain event? Um, ideally, you want to you take your site and you want to shrink your footprint over the winter. You want to permanently stabilize or temporarily stabilize as much as you can. And then if you're active in a certain area, um, you really carefully plan out those BMPs, have BMPs on hand to, to stabilize those if a rain pops up really quick. Um, so this is these are the things that belong in the winterization amendment. Caltrans has a, has a really good spec for it. Um, it should be in your special provisions or uh, the 2008, I think, I would say the 2018 standard specs, but actually now that I remember, it's a revised standard spec. Um, so you'll you'll see it in your special provisions. Um, so we're, we're not going to go over the nuts and bolts um, from there of what's in the winterization amendment, um, but definitely reach out if you have any questions on it, how to answer it, you know, what does one look like? You definitely want to have your consultant prepare a set of drawings that shows what BMPs you need. That really helps um, in addition to the letter that, that may verbally or uh, may uh, have the descriptions of what these are. Um, but what we're gonna focus on today is some, is some good BMPs that belong in your winterization plan um, and some good uh, pictures and, and even some video of what some of these things are that uh, you're gonna wanna put on your site or think about. All right, so here's some ex uh, example photos of winterization. Um, the photo on the left, they were they were working on uh, getting out some fiber roll and getting the site prepped for erosion control. Um, the photo on the right is, this is where we want to get you to. Um, this is a, a really good application of a combination of erosion and sediment control. There's uh, fiber rolls on the slope. Um, these were about 10 feet apart because um, the slope was a two to one slope. And then there was silt fence at the bottom, although it's kind of hard to see in the picture. And then there was some, some erosion control netting on some of the steeper parts that we were worried about erosion. Um, and then all of it had, um, in this case, this was hydroceding because they were able to permanently button up this slope. If you're just looking at something temporary, maybe you need to come back and work on it next spring, um, then maybe you just wanna put temporary hydraulic mulch. You don't wanna put the seeding in it. Um, this particular application had, had uh, seeding, so it was hydroceding. Um, here's some other examples of winterization. Um, the photo on the left, this was actually a uh, bridge raising project in the, the, uh, sorry, the Loomis area. And this was pretty cool because they actually like basically cut the foundation off the bridge and then jacked the bridge up to have more clearance um, on Highway 80. And then they uh, filled in the, the bridge supports with concrete and rebar, uh, thereby raising the bridge up, um, I think a couple feet in some cases. Um, and then they had to uh, regrade the bridge uh, approaches, and so we had new fill slopes going up to each bridge. Um, they weren't quite ready to permanently stabilize it over the winter, um, so they just needed some temporary BMPs because they still had other, other things that they needed to, uh, to finish. So in this case, they put um, fiber rolls on the slope every 10 feet. They had silt vents at the bottom, kind of a catch-all to catch any sediment that did come off the slope. Um, they had erosion control, hydraulic mulch, uh, bonded fiber matrix on the slopes. And then also we had to do a gravel bank berm because we didn't have temporary dike in, or permanent dike in place yet. Uh, they were still working on the final paving at that time. So um, the gravel bank berm was a great um, way to keep the run on um, from going over the slopes and damaging the slopes. So that, that's a very effective thing we wanna talk about a little bit more later. Um, and the picture on the right is kind of a close-up of some temporary hydraulic mulch that was applied um, a few years ago on Highway 12 out near Rio Vista for a new highway um, alignment that we were doing out there. So there's just some good examples. And if I could add something, if you refer to the photo on the left with the slope, if you remember the specification as to winterization, 
that photo on the left has just about every aspect that the specifications requires, that the specification says we need to have with respect to winterization. We have the gravel back berm, that's our stormwater conveyance. We have erosion control, we have perimeter controls. And it really, it's an exceptional photo with respect to winterization. So look at the photo on the left. That's about what we want on your job site, more or less. So good job. I have a couple of things in the chat for you guys. Are you interested in answering a uh, question or addressing these comments now? Or would you like to sure, let's let's take a question. OK, so we have a question for a minute. Uh, Tarvin, Tarno, I'm so sorry if that name is not how you pronounce it. Um, they ask, do you need to make these amendments as quick amendments and upload them to SMART? Yes, um, Caltrans will upload their own SWIP amendments. Um, but if you're if you have a, a non Caltrans project and like a, and you're using like maybe the Casca template, um, yes, the Water Board will want to see your SWIP uh, winterization amendment as an actual amendment to the SWIP and upload it into Smart. So that's a really good question. Caltrans will do that if you get it to Caltrans. Um, they have staff that take care of the, all the Smarts uploading and reporting. And then we have another comment from Mel G that says, I'm a fan of using temporary gravel bags to protect from run on, especially for fill slopes. A absolutely, absolutely. That's some of the worst erosion cases that we've seen um, over the winter were um, lack of some kind of run on control and water uh, getting over the fill slopes. Fill slopes are, are really uh, vulnerable to erosion. And definitely, you want to protect your investment too. If, if the contractor, um, you've spent a lot of time. Uh, building that slope and, and it's uh, almost finished and bought off, um, you certainly don't want to lose it and have to come back and redo it. I had a project where um, we had about $30,000 worth of erosion control have to be redone um, because some run on got over the slope and caused some major damage. It was a major storm too. So um, we had to come back in and add a temporary dike with gravel bags and then they had to regrade and redo um, a significant portion of the slope and the erosion control. So um, it's worth it. We have the questions. Yay! The right now. Good so, questions. Awesome. Awesome questions. All right, here's some other good winterization examples. You want to cover up any stockpiles that you have that are going to be inactive. Um, you also want to cover them like for rain or when not in use. Um, the picture in the middle is kind of a close up view of some silt fencing. That's a good barrier, kind of a good catch all sediment barrier. Um, and then the photos on the right are um, covering some dumpsters, some dumpsters, um, a good example of keeping your waste in leak proof covered bins. All right, so we're going to dive in. Why, um, why do we want to winterize? What if we fail to winterize? Pollution from the job site can come from chemical and cement spills, fuel and oil leaks, solid and hazardous waste, um, homeless activity, which is, is kind of getting more frequent now. Um, and sediment from job sites. These are just some examples of uh, the pollution that can come off of construction sites. Polluted discharges can harm the rivers and creeks we depend on for drinking water, fishing, swimming, recreation, and our food chain. Pollution can directly harm or kill aquatic species and wildlife. Um, here are some pictures. Um, th this is what can happen um, if you fail to winterize properly. Polluted um, or turbid discharges can equal a water board notice of violation and possible fines. Um, this is an example where they just couldn't get the erosion control guys um, out in time, and that and that wasn't the erosion control guys fault. It just um, they just didn't have anybody, um, and so they had to uh, get quotes and get somebody lined up. And at that time, everyone was just super busy and just couldn't get out there. Unfortunately, a storm hit in between that time, um, and so we had. Uh, the turbid water going uh, off the off the unprotected slopes, and it it went down the hill quite a ways actually, and ended up in a, in a creek downstream. And so these pictures actually they're a little blurry. These are actually from the water board from an actual notice of violation. Um, the water board was was very good about um, following the tr the trail of water to where the point it entered the creek at. So um, they actually had video and everything. Um, and this resulted in a $130,000 water board fine. So this is where we're trying to keep you out of. Um, we're just trying to give you some tools in your toolbox um, to get the site uh, adequately protected so this doesn't happen to you. Okay, so we're gonna take it back a little bit. We're gonna answer the following question. What is the best management practice? Um, maybe some of you in the, in the audience aren't necessarily involved with construction, engineering, or stormwater. So we're gonna take it back a little bit and just give you a quick refresher. A BMP, it's a physical practice, but it's not always a physical practice. 
with respect to water pollution control. It's something that we will implement to help minimize water pollution. A BMP can include scheduling of activities, prohibitions practices, maintenance procedures, treatment requirements, operating procedures, controlling site runoff, spills, leaks, sludge, and waste disposal. And what you're probably used to seeing are the fiscal BMPs. That would be your fiber, your salt bins, your stockpile cover, your plastic, um, your slopes for erosion control. Just keep in mind that a BMP is not always physical. It's sometimes a practice like scheduling. You, you can't hold scheduling, but you can hold a fiber. Just take a note of that, please. And all of these practices are used to prevent or reduce the discharge of pollutants. Okay, so we're gonna be going over some of the BMPs that we're likely to see in a winterization amendment. The most common is scheduling. We need to plan ahead. Plan ahead. Rain and construction do not mix well, as Robin explained in the notice of violation. Arguably, the primary BMP with respect to winterization is scheduling. Another type that we're gonna see is erosion control. Erosion control can come in the form of geotextiles, such as erosion control blanket, plastic cover, temporary hydraulic mulch, hydro seeding, and wood or straw mulch. And all of these are erosion controls. And remember, we need an effective combination of erosion and sediment control. We need both to be successful, not just one. Here's an example of hydraulic mulch, an application of hydraulic mulch. We have a big project in Sacramento. We partnered with Solvesis Erosion Control. We went out and we sprayed hydraulic mulch. It comes out green so that we could see where it's being applied. That way we don't accidentally miss a spot. That's a big truck that they bring out. The operator operating the cannon is actually our very own, Miss May McGuire. So good job, she did an exceptional job. And uh, that's what it looks like. So if you ever see them on the side of the freeway, if you ever see an area of dirt that's been sprayed green, there's a good chance it's hydraulic mulch. And we're, uh, later on at the end, if, if we have time, we have a video from uh, Jay Selby with uh, Selby Soil and Erosion Control, and he'll talk about some fire restoration work that they did. Um, and I'll have some of the winterization BMPs that we're talking about. Another type of erosion control that we often see is what we call erosion control blanket. Photo on the left, we have a, a slope that was stabilized with erosion control blanket. Photo on the right, we have the application of the erosion control blanket. I want to emphasize the photo on the right. If you look closely, you could see that the crew is trenching in the erosion control blanket. It's really important that we trench in the blanket, also known as key in, because we don't want the water, the storm water, to undermine the blanket and erode the slope mm -hmm. underneath, which if it does happen, we're going to have a bad day. So prevent it from happening by trenching in your blanket at the top. Likewise, you're going to want it weighed down or trench it in with fiber rolls. This is a, an application with fiber rolls. So we installed the blanket, then we put the fiber rolls on top. So just make sure you install it per the plan, per the spec. Open up your standard plans, take a look, call your QSV and or QSD if you need assistance. Mm -hmm. and, and another key thing to think about when you're doing blanket is you really have to have the slope properly prepared ahead of time. It, it has to be finished in a manner that it's, it's smooth enough that the blanket, when you roll it down, is going to have intimate soil contact. Um, if it's too rough and water can get under the blanket, it's just going to reel as if the blanket weren't there. So um, proper slope preparation um, and that key trench up at the top are, are really important. And overlapping your blanket too, um, at least by a foot, to make sure that um, any gaps are uh, covered. Okay, here we have an example of plastic cover. So likewise, um, plastic cover is an erosion control BMP. We want to trench it in at the top, just like we saw in the previous photo, and we want to weigh it down with gravel bags and rope. So here's a really good photo, a really good, I'm sorry, a really good video and a good application of plastic cover. So that's also acceptable as a temporary erosion control EMP. If that's what you choose to use for a job site, maybe you have a slope that's not finished yet, that's definitely an acceptable BMP. Yeah. Um, one thing I did want to mention about plastic is the waterboard uh, really wants to discourage the use of plastic. So ideally, you might want to look to the other BMPs first, um, your uh, hydraulic mulch um, or maybe your blankets, um, and then utilize the plastic for those limited areas where uh, the other two just don't make sense. Maybe this is a slope that you're working on when it's not raining, um, and the plastic will allow you to um, keep that slope dry 
and then open it back up um, when you have periods of dry weather. So just thinking about where you wanna use plastic, I wouldn't button up your whole site with it, um, use it where it makes sense. Another erosion control BMP that's most commonly used for permanent erosion control measures is what we call hydro seeding. Similar to hydraulic mulch, hydro seeding is also an erosion control BMP. The main difference is that this is gonna have seed. So like I said, it's mostly used for permanent erosion control practices. Once we have a slope that has been finished, we would put hydro seed because we wanna ultimately stabilize it with grass or some other vegetative matter. Um, that way we can close out the permit once our, our construction activity has been completed. This is hydro seeding. If you remember the previous video, it comes out green. Once it dries up after maybe a week or two, it'll start to turn brownish, such as the photos. Likewise, we wanna install five rolls. Anything else, Robin, about hydro seeding? Um, well, you can see the picture on the right is a really good thick application. You wanna make sure that whether you're doing hydraulic mulch or the hydro seeding, which is the mulch with the seed, um, you want a good thick coat enough that you're really not seeing that dirt below. And you're probably going to want to follow um, the specs that are that are in the job site. If you don't have a good spec um, or that maybe is missing on what to do, um, you want to follow the manufacturer's recommendations or reach out to us, your QSD or your QSP. Um, depending on the application, for example, you have steep slopes, you're going to want to maybe make sure you have 4,000 pounds per acre of BFM. Um, that's a lot of material, so just make sure you're putting it on um, in a thick enough coat uh, that you're not getting any shadowing. Um, shadowing is when maybe you, you've sprayed it from the top and then you, you go down and look below and, it, and it's not hitting the, the bottom parts of the soil particles or the rock. So you definitely want to uh, spray from different directions and just get that thick enough coverage to form that blanket or matting. That's very important. And if you look at the photo on the right, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to tell, but the grass is actually starting to sprout. You can see little specks of green. So good job. Excellent erosion control application. It's always this erosion control. They were the ones who applied it. Excellent work. Next slide, please. Another erosion control BMP is what we call straw mulch. Photo on the left, we have once again our very own or Selby's erosion control. They're doing an exceptional job at applying straw mulch. Photo on the right is a different angle, same project. Likewise, uh, it's an erosion control BMP. You don't usually see it too much because it's kind of expensive and it's labor intensive. It would require a lot of scheduling. Um, that's actually a permanent application, but you can use it for temporary measures. Likewise, like I mentioned before, if you need guidance, talk to your QSD and or P. Good photo of straw mulch. Anything else, Robin? Yeah, uh, make sure that when you do apply straw mulch, it should have some kind of tackifier on it. That can be you know, just water and psyllium um, that's actually like providing a bonding agent to tack it down so it keeps from blowing away. And a really good straw mulch application isn't just an inch or two. It could mean, you know, four plus inches. So if you're going to use it, um, follow the specs and, and make sure it's applied properly. Wood mulch. So another erosion control BMP. Photo on the left, we have a few stockpiles of wood mulch. Photo on the right is after the fact. Once we apply it to the wood mulch, that's what it looks like. This was actually a permanent erosion control measure. However, it can also be used for temporary erosion control. So take that into account. Talk to your QSD if you need any guidance. Photo on the left, we have a storm brewing. We have nice, thick, dark clouds. Photo on the right was when the storm went away. So we went out there, we sampled, everything looked good. Thanks to the, yeah, the wood mulch, so good job. All right, well, now we're gonna talk about um, the best management practices for sediment control. Um, thank you, Juan. Yep. And that, those are all Juan's photos, by the way, and video of all the erosion control. So um, that's not necessarily all the erosion control, but that's the main types that we see. And those are the ones we want you to think about in your toolbox. Um, now we're gonna talk about the sediment control. These are your linear barriers. These are used in addition with your erosion control. So the erosion control is what's keeping the dirt on, on the ground in place. Your sediment control is what can you do to help it from migrating and then getting actually out and off. So these are kind of your last defense barriers. Most common types, um, silt fence, check dams, fiber rolls or wattles, gravel bags, um, earthen berms, um, street sweeping, that's actually sediment control because you're actually sweeping up and removing sediment. And then storm drain inlet protection. These are the most common types. Um, sediment control BMPs prevent construction site soils and other sediments from washing into gutters, drains, and waterways.
All right, so let's dive in. Fiber roll, this is a very common one. It's used for perimeter control of disturbed soil areas. Um, used for slope interruption, so you can have it on your slope every uh, 10 feet for a two to one slope, for example. Um, if your slope is not as steep, you can do less spacing and there's actual guidelines in the, uh, there's a CASCA or Caltrans BMP manual that'll have a slope spacing recommendation. Um, they must be installed on a level contour that just helps to make sure that the water is not concentrating on any one point of the fiber roll. Um, and so as much as possible, put it on a level contour. Um, it must be properly trenched in and staked down every four feet. Um, the water board is very picky about this and so are the Caltrans inspectors. Um, and that for good reason, if a BMP is not installed properly, it's not gonna work to its best. Um, so you definitely wanna get that trenching in um, and the staking in. There is another method for installation that doesn't require um, uh, trenching in. We often see that for permanent installations, that's where uh, there are stakes on both sides and it's lashed down with rope. Um, the picture here on the right is, um, it wasn't quite installed properly. The stakes are too far apart um, and it wasn't all the way trenched in. Although we were still happy to see it there, um, but they did have to come back and uh, tweak it a little bit. So that, that's fiber roll. This also is, um, permanent type. Um, it doesn't have plastic netting. And if you're working on a Caltrans job, um, you no longer can use the plastic netted type. The specs will actually say that for temporary and permanent, they want um, no plastic netting. So this is the biodegradable water. I think it's a waddle. It's uh, like a burlap sack around it. So it's, it's pretty nice stuff. It's also good for use um, in creeks um, or sensitive areas. Silt fence. So silt fence is, is another great product that you'll see. It's really good at the, at the perimeter and the toe of slopes. Um, you want to offset it from the toe of slope at least three feet. You definitely don't want to install it on a slope. That can create some issues. Um, so try to keep it off your slope and just have it be at the toe of your slopes. Um, silt fence is designed to impound water where the fiber will let water throw flow through it. Um, so silt fence is great where maybe you have a creek or a sensitive area that you want to keep your sediment um, and water out of. And so the silt fence is going to do a really good job at that, um, provided that you don't have too much area draining to it. Um, it also must be installed on a level contour. Um, if you don't, it'll, it'll accelerate the water. Water will hit the silt fence and then flow down, uh, down gradient. So you definitely want to keep it on a level contour where you can. Um, it must be properly trenched in also at least a six inch deep by six inch wide trench and then you backfill. It should have the stakes every six feet. And ideally you wanna use uh, two inch by two inch stakes um, and the stakes must be on the backside. The photo on the right, um, that was actually done on purpose um, with the stakes on the inside because the biologist uh, didn't want the critters being able to crawl up the stakes on the backside and get into the job site. Um, so, so in this case, they just couldn't do it that way. Um, but it really wasn't working too good as silt fence because when the water impounded up against the silt fence, it just pulled away from the stakes and turbid water got out. So um, just showing you what happens, why the stakes should be on the backside. Um, gravel bags. These are another great tool in your toolbox. You can use them um, around uh, uh, inlets for inlet protection. You can use them for check dams and you can use them for temporary dike, um, your run on control. Um, again, like uh, one of the uh, participants mentioned for protecting your fill slopes. Um, you wanna avoid the white woven bags um, that are photodegradable um, and they unravel and then, you, and then your sand or your rock comes out. Also, you wanna use the, the Caltrans approved bags of non-woven geotextile, they're the black bags. Um, they, you should be uh, filling in with 30 pounds um, with clean rock. You don't want to use sand, although I do recognize sand uh, does seal better if you're making coffer dams. Um, however, um, please just try to use the rock bags. The sand is a contaminant itself when the bag busts open. Um, uh, yeah, that's all I want to say about check dams. The, uh, gravel bags, they're great, a great tool. So get, get some extra pallets out there, have them on hand for emergencies over winter. Um, I, uh, I've always appreciated having some extra on hand because you will find uh, spots to button up where you need them. And remember, material and labor, that's one of the items for the specification. You got to keep your labor and material up to date when it comes to your winterization plan. So have extra materials on hand, just like Robin mentioned. They'll come in handy. Yeah, good. Yeah, because when a rain event hits, um, everybody's going to the supply stores trying to get everything. And I've actually had a bad winter where um, the supply stores were out 
They didn't have any plastic or gravel bags. And I tell you what, that's not a fun position to be in because then you're like, crap, now what do we do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Rain's coming tomorrow. Um, all right, storm rain and the protection. The, these should be in place year round uh, along with your perimeter control. Um, but now is definitely a time to tune it up. Um, maybe you had filter fabric blocking your inlets over the over the summer when you were maybe grading or paving, um, but that's not a great uh, uh, application for winter time because you want to let your inlets drain and you're going to get a lot of water and flooding um, issues if you don't open up your inlets. So make sure all your inlets are tied in also and that water can get into them. If, if you're in a, a state where maybe you don't have all your, uh, your storm drainage in yet, um, definitely uh, reach out and, and we can help you come up with a, a plan. Where's that water gonna go and how are we gonna get it to the right spot safely? Um, the uh, storm drain protection, um, it must be, if you're on a Caltrans job, you wanna use the approved sediment bags. Um, you wanna protect your, your, your inlets year round um, and you wanna keep them clean to keep them free of sediment. Um, and the sediment bags also need to have a high flow bypass inside. Um, that's so if the, the bag fills up with debris, it can at least get through the holes inside and at kind of at the top of the bag um, and still get into the drain inlet. So these are just some good examples. Um, the one on the right is the Urtec product, the Urtec covers. And the one on the left had a sediment bag inside um, with the gravel bags around it. Another thing you wanna do for winterization is um, look at your stabilized construction entrances. They should already be in place, um, but now they're even more important if you didn't have them in place. Um, you wanna uh, have some options here. So you can use uh, the FODS mats. That was, uh, 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 this is actually from Highway 50 where they're easy to use because they can uh, put them on, on top of the pavement. You can't really put rock on top of the pavement. Um, these also uh, work in lieu of the, the metal rumble plates. You can have those too. Um, but anyway, the FODS mats were a, a cool option because they were easy to pick up and carry and, and relocate as their job site conditions uh, needed to change the entrances. The one on the right, this was actually up in uh, the Colfax area and they were uh, stabilizing not only the entrance, but they were actually stabilizing to the, the roadway in and out. So that's very important to eliminate tracking um, another another way to for to uh, to uh, control your construction sites is also think about blocking off areas where you don't want people going in and out. Um, if you do have a rock entrance, make sure that it's uh, properly installed. Um, it should have some kind of fabric underneath it. Um, you want the rock to be three inches to six inches in diameter, and it should be a minimum twenty feet wide by fifty feet long um, by a foot thick. With respect to construction entrances, I recommend blocking off the sides of the entrance, the flared end, the, the flared end portion, that is to keep the vehicles from driving off of the construction exit. Oftentimes what they'll do is they'll cut a corner. You have your nice construction exit and they'll cut around and now you still have tracking. So I always recommend to my clients or to the clients, block off the, uh, the edges. That way the vehicles stay channeled through the TC1 or the construction exit. Usually we do this with T-post and orange fencing. And anyways, just a little thought, helps yep. out. Yep, or K rail. Or K rail. <laughs> All right. So, what is a run on control measure? This is very important for winterization. You want to think about what water is going to uh, cause or havoc that's coming into your site um, and getting where it shouldn't be. So, a run on control measure um, saves your erosion. These um, prevent stormwater from contacting the site and diverts it around or safely through the work area. Um, that uh, again, I'll point out this example because this this will save you many times um, the gravel bag berms for your temporary dike. That's a, an example of run on control. Um, slope conveyance. That's another item that you want to talk about in your winterization amendments. Um, a slope conveyance is how you're going to get that water safely over your slope or or around it. Um, you want to install on top of well compacted soil. Um, you want to ensure that any, any matting is anchored down to prevent movement from coming underneath. Um, this is like a plastic, uh, oh, basically we made a plastic, or the contractor made a plastic overside drain. There was water coming off the highway up top, going over their slope. And uh, we, we didn't have any other choice where to put that water. So we just said, okay, let's, uh, let's have it go over here, but let's put it on plastic so that we're not uh, eroding the slope. Um, you may want to have a uh, riprap at the end um, to help uh, help dissipate the energy. Um, this is just one example of slope conveyance. You could also have a pipe. Um, that would be super awesome. Sometimes that's super expensive. Um, so 
make something, get creative. Before we continue to our next slide, which is our big deal, Chase L. Uh, we have a comment and from Mel D that says in the 2022 California CGP, in attachment D, it specifically says limit construction activity, uh, traffic to and from the project to entrances and exits that employ effective control to prevent off site tracking. So that's just a snippet from the new CGP. Activity. That's perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. awesome. That's perfect. Yeah, the new the new permit's only going to get harder. Um, so I anyway, I appreciate that. And we also have a comment from Jarek of the County of Santa Clara who said who asked that we can please share a copy of the slides because this is all such great information and the photos are really great too. Awesome. So, yes. So absolutely. Um, feel free to email me. I'll respond to them in the comments. But the next slide is James Bunny. Can we go back to the salt ones real quick? I yeah. kind of want to bring up a brief point. All right, the salt fence. So one of the benefits of salt fence, one thing that I really recommend salt fence is that, and fibrils is that a perimeter control BMP also helps delineate your construction site. It'll help mm -hmm. keep your, your soil disturbance contained to a specific area. Now, remember that once we have a rain event, hence the winterization amendment, we're going to have to stabilize whatever we've disturbed. If you minimize your footprint of soil disturbance, that's less area that you have to stabilize come a rain event. So I love recommending salt fence because it's less likely to be ran over versus fiber rule. Anybody could drive over a fiber rule really easy, but there's something about a salt fence, you probably don't want to run it over just as much. So perimeter control BMPs, particularly salt fence and anything that's kind of high off the ground, it delineates your site. It'll keep the crew members from encroaching and encroaching, which in turn, you're gonna have to stabilize at a later time. So keep your footprint small, that's it. All right. So um, I know there's a lot, a, a lot of other considerations to think about. Um, definitely reach out to your QSD um, for designing your winterization plan, um, and then reach out to your QSP too, because they they can uh, provide more information to your QSD on uh, what the site is missing um, or uh, or maybe needs to be altered or beefed up for the winter. Um, we're going to go into a, a great video from Jay Selby. Um, I know it's not necessarily directly talking about winterization, but they're using a lot of these same components. And he's gonna talk about what they had to do to uh, mitigate the rim fire, which was actually a huge, uh, pretty historical fire that occurred in Yosemite many years ago. Um, and this is part of uh, Jay's expertise in fire restoration. So enjoy, and thank you, Jay, for doing this. Um, it was pretty cool. We got to, uh, we got to capture him for, for a brief moment. Hi, I'm Jay Selby, president of Selby Soil Erosion Control. Our company was founded in 1968 by my father. Uh, why that's important is because the EPA wasn't even formed until 1970, and the Clean Water Act was formed in 1972 um, that governs all of our work now. That, that was a platform that started everything. We have an office in Newcastle, California, which is near Sacramento. We also have an office in Idaho. So we cover Idaho, Washington, Montana, Oregon, California, and Nevada. We have a great team. Um, I, I joined on in 1995 underneath my dad. And in 2000, I became the president and uh, just been growing and growing since then. I wanna talk about wildfires today. We do a lot of fire uh, remediation work. So I had a presentation I wanted to share that I put together for Caltrans uh, many years ago um, about the Rim Fire. 2013 was the Rim Fire, uh, which is in Yosemite, California, one of our favorite national parks. And uh, it was a really big fire. On August 17th, uh, 2013, a hunter's illegal fire went out of control and began the Yosemite Rim Fire. During the course, nearly 260,000 acres were burned, 400 square miles, 11 residents, three commercial buildings, 98 outbuildings were lost before being contained on October 24th. The Rim Fire was the third largest fire in history at that point in time that cost over 127 million to fight and 5,000 firefighters were dispatched to Yosemite. 
There were 10, 10 injuries on this fire. The smoke, uh, you can see it from, from satellites. It traveled all the way to Lake Tahoe and Reno. Jerry Brown, the governor at the time, declared a state of emergency for the city of San Francisco due to damage by the fire to power infrastructures that served the Bay Area. Wildlife officials and biologists had to tend to displaced animals and were concerned with Western pond turtles and bald eagles. Many animals were killed and their habitat destroyed, including hundreds of cattle that grazed the area. Plans were approved for logging 52 square miles uh, for roadside trees for public safety and worker safety. Caltrans headquarters, uh, Jack Rockbed, assessed the impacts to State Route 120 from Buck Meadows to Yosemite Park entrance and identified critical areas of concern. District 10 engineers first contacted us to see if we'd participate in the project. And uh, our resident engineer and, and us drove the damage. And we worked off notes that Jack supplied of the 17 mile stretch of, of Route 120. Our involvement on September 20th, 2013, an emergency contract was awarded from Caltrans to us with a budget of 1.2 million for soil stabilization, bonded fiber matrix, as well as other erosion control measures like check dams, timber and debris removal, contour log terraces, cleaning of existing draining systems and monitoring and maintenance through the winter and then a reassessment in the spring of 2014. If you can see on the, the pictures, the before and after, how burnt the ground was, completely scarred. We worked with uh, the forestry service to design a seed mix that they were happy with and it grew in really nicely. Here's a area where the drainage was pretty undersized for the culverts. So we lined the fiber rolls, we rip wrapped the middle, and then we hydro seeded the bonded fiber matrix all around it, trying to control the speed of sediment traveling towards them. Slope protection. In other areas, we found steep slopes severely burned with the potential of mudslide and falling rocks. We had many trees severely burned that had the potential of falling onto Route 120. If you can see in the picture on, on the top, all the little debris that would be heading towards the drain and uh, we removed it and we BFM'd it and then in the spring it looked beautiful. If you look at the there's a definite line of where we stopped spraying and in the bottom picture you can see that there's no growth above that line. Oh, yeah. Hydro seeding and check dams. We worked our way from mile marker 40 to 56 using profile products hydro blanket a bonded fiber matrix. Depending on the severity of the burn and slope steepness we either use 2,000 or 4,000 pounds per acre of BFM. Trash racks were installed in steep ravine culvert inlets. We used coir netting on potential landslide areas. Then we fiber rolled on top of them and then hydro seeded it. Came out beautiful. I mean, it looks like nothing ever happened. And this area was definitely an area that would have slid had we not touched it. We also used pine needles where we could and we use a paper mulch along with a tackifier to hold the pine needles down. We had to control uh, the flow lines. Our critical concerns were drainage areas. The inlet pipes that took water from one side of the road to the other were undersized for today's standards and could easily get filled up with ash and sediment and plug up, causing flooding and undermining roadway integrities. Forest in bloom. We finished the operation on November 9th of 2013, right before winter set in. We monitored the project through the winter and had zero failures. In the spring of 2014, the forest was in full bloom. There was many wildflowers that sit and wait for a fire. And there were wildflowers that hadn't bloomed in nearly a hundred years in this area. Awesome. Restoration was a success. We came under budget. We actually, did more maintenance in the spring because we had leftover funds and we actually increased some of their culvert sizes. So it was a success. And this has uh, been a case study that Caltrans has used ever since in their firework. Thank you.
I love it, guys. That I, I really appreciate uh, Jay doing that video for us um, and uh, be, being willing to share some of his expertise. Um, there's a lot of great erosion control subs out there, so um, there's many to choose from. If you need help uh, finding one, um, definitely let us know and we can get you a list. So but anybody got any questions or, or comments? All right, awesome. Um, all right, well, just take care of your sites. Um, our suggestion would be call your erosion control sub as early as you can, even if you're not ready yet. Um, just uh, get them on the books, uh, you know, plan on having them come out the week before October 15th, um, if you can. Um, granted, they're probably going to be busy. So, um, you know, maybe think about some other dates in the schedule that'll work and be thinking about what you can button up ahead of time, reducing that um, open footprint. So anyway, thanks guys. Thanks for having us. Thanks, All right. John. Well, thank you. Thank you, Robin. And thank you, Juan. Uh, great presentation. Um, I, I have a question though, uh, just as yeah. far as how often should throughout the winter, should you be readdressing these issues? I mean, we get it ready for the winter, yeah. but do we just leave it alone and see what happens until spring? I think that's a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is no, you're not going to leave it alone and you're going to keep checking on it. So your QSP yeah. should be out there once a week and pre-storm during storm and post-storm. Um, I think how often you're going to need to touch it up is going to depend on um, how often it rains and what kind of water damage you're seeing. Um, your QSP is going to want to look for, and you uh, as the as the contractor or the owner um, can you know, check on it yourself also, um, and look look for signs of rilling. Look for anywhere that it, it, that uh, hydraulic mulch or maybe your plastic, you know, is coming off, coming apart, um, or your hydraulic mulch is wearing thin. Um, we have had to reapply it. Um, we sometimes, like especially those first couple storms that come, um, maybe we don't have all the the right BMPs, or we we thought we had the right BMPs in place, but maybe we need more, and maybe some you know heavy runoff gets on those slopes and washes some of it away, um, or causes some reeling maybe you didn't expect. Um, so definitely, it, it usually takes us a couple storms to get everything really dialed in, all the all the sediment controls and check dams and slope conveyance in place where we need it. Um, and then, you know, come out and respray and, and touch up. Um, it, it's not uncommon to have to touch up at least once over the winter. Um, again, depending on what kind of rain you get, you know, maybe you're, luck, maybe you're lucky of sorts that you don't get rain on your construction site and you don't need to touch it up, but also that's unlucky that uh, we do need the rain because we're in a drought. So um, right. anyway, great, great question, John, thank you. Right, well, thank, thank you to, to both of you for presenting and being a part of Stormwater Awareness Week. So uh, we still have a couple more classes left of the of the um, of the week. We're almost to the finish line, uh, but the good news is, if you missed any of these or want to go back and watch one, uh, you can access them. Um, we put the link in the chat. Just go to the same place you signed up for this workshop and look under the menu to. Uh, recorded sessions for 2022. Also, we're going to put the notes for uh, uh, to today's presentation by Robin and Juan under the resources. So you go to the menu, look for resources. They'll be linked right there. So you can download a PDF copy of, of this presentation. So, all right. Well, we'll see you maybe in the next workshop. Thank you to all of you who participated in today's workshop. Before we sign off, John, there's one more question we'd like to ask. Oh, sure. Yes. Thank you. For, thank you so much. Um, so we have a question from Garrick. Are there any reputable contractors out there for installing BMPs? We often have sites with an owner or operator who do not have expertise in BMP installation, and this often causes some problems for our inspectors. Yeah, yeah. And, and granted, depending on the size of your site might determine the size of a erosion control subcontractor that we'd recommend. Um, I know I'm probably going to miss some, but if I name off a few, um, I don't want to offend anybody by not mentioning them. Um, I'm just probably going to draw a blank. <laughs> but, but some of the top ones that I know of, um, soil, uh, Selby Soil and Erosion Control, they've been around a long time. They have the big equipment, um, and they, they definitely can help you out. There's also Team EES. Um, they've, uh, they've been around a while, too. They're doing a great job. 
Um, there's also a, a newer company, Arctos. They are the public works um, side of Emerald Site Services. Um, Emerald Site Services is another one um, that they do the private, more private work. Um, uh, where soil, uh, Selby Soil and Erosion Control and TME, yes, they do both private work and uh, Caltrans or public works. Um, other ones on NIDA Erosion Control. Um, mm, uh, there's J and S. Um, there's a, there's a lot green growth. That's another one. Um, and then I think it's Marine Vista. So actually, there there's quite a lot. So um, if you want to uh, send May an email, um, it's May at TullyGroup.com. She can get a hold of us and um, we can get you a list. Anybody I'm missing? I think you got them all. Yeah. Yeah, oh, not, yeah. oh, not GNS, it was GNM land restoration. Sorry about that. So, um, but anyway, what uh, some of the biggest players that we see are um, Selby's um, and Team EES and Green Growth lately on the Caltrans jobs we've been doing in the uh, this area. Any other questions? We got a few minutes left. John, you got anything? No, no. Uh, yeah, no, you guys did a great job. And uh, yeah, we've teamed up with uh, Selby Soils uh, and, and they're a great resource. So a shout out to Jay. He's, he's, he does a great job. Yeah, he, he helped us out a lot and uh, it was pretty cool. We got to see him on a fire restoration job uh, two years ago at Lake Berryessa um, and then on US 50 recently. And then um, he let May actually come out and play around with the hydro seeding gun. That was pretty fun. Um, and uh, yeah, definitely, I think hydraulic mulch is probably one of your number one erosion control methods because it's um, it's really fairly effective and affordable. It's a lot easier to go spray a bunch um, versus trying to install blanket um, or uh, mess with plastic all winter long. So um, think about hydraulic mulch as much as you can. It's a great tool. Yeah, yeah. And if I could just add one more thing before closing, um, remember when we're preparing with tri-station amendments or plans, open up that standard specification. It's somewhere in section 13, and I believe it's revised standard specifications, 2018. Just open up the standard specs and go down the list, everything that you got to check off. So that's about it. We gave you like a brief overview as to how to prepare a plan, but um, just yes. open up that spec and check it off. And we have another Stormwater Awareness Week workshop that um, Bob Schultz, actually, yeah. I think he was on today's, uh, uh, today's workshop too. He presented. Uh, more more in detail as far as what goes into the document. So this presentation and his are very uh, good. If you if yours is more pragmatic and what needs to happen in the field, his was more what needs to happen on the paper and in the Perfect. schedule. So if you watch these two, I think you'd have a really good handle on your winterization plans. Awesome, perfect. And yeah. we and we collaborate with Bob a lot. We uh, bounce ideas off of each other. So. I'm glad that our presentations were compatible and not exactly the same things. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I'm excited to check that yeah. one out. I'll have to, uh, I'll have to do some research and yeah. take some time to watch it. All right, thanks. Uh, we're, we're all right, well, to... but thank you. I don't think we have any more questions. This is your last chance. Unmute yourself real quick if you want to shoot a question out to us. Or our, a <laughs> I'm just playing no complaints. <laughs> All right. Well, good. Thank you again. And uh, we'll see you guys in the next workshop. Awesome. Thank so. you. Thanks for putting this together, John. All That's right, great. everyone.